Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of State of Cybercrime. It is so exciting to be here today. Uh, my name is Matt Radelak, one of our hosts. I'm joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues from Veronis, uh, co-host David Gibson. Want to say hello, David? Hello. How are you doing, everybody? Hey, Matt. Hello. Hey, Devere. And yeah, we're also joined by a celebrity guest star from Veronis Threat Labs, Devere. Want to say hi, Devere? Hi. Good morning. How's everyone? It's awesome to be here today. Now, let's crack right into it. We'll go through our usual segments today. We'll talk about whether or not there's any good news. We'll cover the, the happenings with AI. We'll jump on into the danger zone and talk about a couple of breaches you should be aware of. We'll cover those vulnerable vulnerabilities, especially that zero day from Avanti, as well as make time, always make time at the end for Q&A from our audience. Feel free to use the chat or the Q&A uh, throughout the show today, and we'll do our best to respond. We always like to kick off the show by covering good news in cybersecurity, because oftentimes it's all doom and gloom. You hear about hacks, you hear about breaches, you hear about victims of various different types of cybercrime, and there is a lot of good news happening out there. In fact, I actually think we have a record number of good news stories today with three and a half, I'll say. Uh, and I'll give you guys a teaser for something that we'll talk about later. So, you know, Operation Ghost Town was an operation conducted by U.S. federal authorities that led to the successful takedown of a KV botnet from a KVM seller, which was a China-linked VPN network who allegedly targeted small office and home office routers by providing reliable server hosting, RDP tools, and VPNs to cyber criminals to conduct malicious activities. Now, this is another blow to cybercrime and hopefully sends a message that U.S. law enforcement will take down even the third party providers of cyber criminals. Yeah. And, you know, I, I thought this was interesting that the, the targeting of the Soho routers, I, I was curious from our listeners, how many people actually use the router that comes with their Internet provider or like, do you replace it? Do you um, have another firewall behind that, uh, or you, you know, or do you just use what the what the internet you're just provider gives directly you directly into the modem? Yeah, the yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm curious if people want to chat in what they do. It's like it, uh, it, and what what people are using these days. I'm uh, using the yeah, the PFSense. Yeah. A couple people PF want sense. ISP ISP provided. Yeah. We got PFSense, yeah. Fortinet firewall, purchasing my own. A All couple of yeah, and PFSense is making a, a, a stay here. It looks like it excites yeah. you here. And for people that don't know what that is, Devere, you want to tell people what PFSense is? So PFSense is quite an awesome product, an open source product for uh, running your own type of gateway with IDS, IPS, um, and again, protecting your network on, on the gateway level. There is also... OpenSense, which is a combination between PFSense and Onion Security and Bro, allowing you to have a streamlined solution uh, as an open source uh, running, uh, uh, yeah, running, uh, 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 running Linux and yeah, simple as that. Open source solution for home events, and sounds like a few of our audience members are leveraging that. Now, David, there was some crypto good news as well, if you wanted to tell our audience about that. Yeah, it... Um... It, it's pretty interesting. Uh, we've had a couple of, uh, of folks that um, were doing SIM swapping, which uh, we should probably explain what that is. Um, first guy is aptly named uh, Daniel James Chunk, um, and, and, and he, he got caught in April, it looks like, from what I read, and, and uh, he kept on uh, doing his thing and uh, so was was arrested again and has been sentenced. Um, but SIM swapping, as I understand it, there are a couple ways. You can do a physical SIM swap, right? Take somebody's phone uh, and then put in a different SIM there. Um, but I think the, the way that they were doing it in this attack was actually to kind of con a, you know, a Verizon or an AT&T AT into switching your number, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of like yeah, I think that's type thing. A couple of artists have already chimed in that yeah. we don't even have that physical sim anymore. I remember, I think it was yep. maybe 10, 15 years ago, people were talking about how if you're at the bar and someone grabs your phone, they could swap your SIM card real quick and Venmo someone else. But I think largely that's been done away with. 
Yeah. And but anyway, once you get somebody control of somebody's number with, uh, you know, the, the SIM swap, then, you know, all of the stuff that uses your phone for MFA becomes kind of then, you know, not secure. Um, so he wasn't the only one that was busted for this. Uh, Florida man was also uh, involved in this. Uh, this guy Sosa or he had an alias King Bob was also um, re- arrested for this recently. And this uh, the one interesting thing I learned from reading about this arrest was that in addition to stealing money and data, he also liked to collect unreleased recordings of rap songs, which are called rails. I'd never heard of this, but apparently they can sell for like five to twenty five k a track. Wow. Um, so uh, yeah, it gave me some new ideas for my musical direction. And like we said before, record-breaking three good news stories today. The yeah. Department of Justice arrested two suspects in the hacking of more than 68,000 DraftKings accounts from hacks that dated all the way back to November of 2022. DraftKings has refunded some number of hundreds of thousands of dollars to those nearly 68,000 affected customers, and three parties were named, uh, two of which were responsible for actually hacking the accounts, and then one person, which is who they sold the accounts to. And how they cashed out is they they sent instructions to, to, to buyers or bettors and telling them to add a new payment method and deposit $5. And then what would happen is they would then withdraw all the funds. Now, along with this news, kind of hearing about what happened to DraftKings, another important thing thing to note is that the FBI has actually warned of more credential stuffing attacks on the horizon. Uh, We covered one in our last episode uh, around sort of the, you know, who's responsible in a credential stuffing attack. Is it the provider or is it the users? Uh, And the FBI warned that both FanDuel and Chick-fil-A are being targeted for credential stuffing attacks. It's uh, two, two very different organizations there, I would say, right? Yeah, a, a different motivations for yeah, sure. For sure. Please don't come after different the, verticals. Please don't come after the nuggies, though. Yeah. We kicked off a new segment, AI Vay, because you know nobody's tired of hearing about AI, and you're probably all saying oh, Vay to yourselves. So uh, we do have an interesting story to cover here. Something that happened in Italy, if I want to remember correctly, David. Yeah, it looks like um, the Data Protection Authority in Italy, uh, which is called Garante, I believe, if I'm saying that correctly, has uh, has found uh, ChatGPT. They, they actually been going back and forth for a while. They had uh, uh, kind of a first suit last year. They said you're you're uh, violating multiple articles of the GDPR. Um, and more recently, they've kind of re-upped. And I think, you know, it, it's raising some interesting questions, like who gave them uh, the permission to scrape the internet, um, you know, which does include personal data. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the harm that it's calling out is that messages and payment information uh, have been exposed. Um, and uh, they're also talking about how ChatGPT doesn't have a system to verify ages of users. So, uh, you know, kids can ask questions that and get answers that may not be appropriate for them. So I, I think it's going to be it, it's kind of an interesting uh, tack to take and some some really tough questions. You know, when people put data out on the Internet, you know, did they intend for an AI to be able to mine it? You know, I'm curious what what folks think on this one. And, you know, all I have to say is niente più robo per te. No robots for you, translated into Italian. Um, and, you know, I, every episode when we're trying to find out things that are kind of happening in AI and what we want to cover with you, it seems like every single week it's someone had some data spill in an unattended way due to the AI having too much access to too much information. So if there's one theme, and though we're only two segments into the year so far, it's to think about the data that you're giving to AI as the data set to train it on, as it might just use it in a response. Absolutely. Now, in our next segment, we'll cover some of the dangerous happenings that are going on in cybersecurity, like big breaches and things that you should know. Now, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the rise of this kind of fake breach, right? First, we had deep fakes where 
people who are impersonating other people. And now we've got uh, uh, hackers purportedly uh, putting out fake data and saying that they breached an organization. At least that's what looks to be the case after Europe card denies claims that a threat off actor uh, offered to sell data on 50 million of their customers on a hacking forum. And, and what your car is saying is that it, for, to them, at least, it's clear that artificial intelligence was used due to some inconsistencies and some mismatches in the data set. On the other hand, though, Troy Hunt doesn't necessarily think that that might be the case, not saying that the data is fake or real, but that AI usually produces more consistent results than what's found in this data set, like lots of non-existent usernames and non-existent addresses. And so when David and I were prepping for the show today, I was just asking ChatGPT myself, like, generate me a list of usernames and fake addresses. And I got it back. So it's hard to say, like, was this data made by AI? Is it real and just not a cleaned up database? Was it completely fabricated by the attackers? Because one thing's for sure, your car is not the only one to cry fake breach. Uh, Ars Technica did as well. And so I guess, you know, only time's going to tell who the real hackers are and who the real victims are. But I think one thing is for sure. We know all attacks, fake or not, are going after data. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I have to kind of give whatever Troy says a, a good look because he's uh, he's usually right about a lot of stuff. So it's, uh, it's interesting in this one. But it's going to be really hard to tell as AI gets better. Um, I think it's going to be very hard to tell a, a real breach from a fake breach. Now, that wasn't the only dangerous things going on. You know, I feel like we talk about log for shell either every episode or every other episode since about 2021. What's what's happening with Fritz Frog? Well, we have a frog for shell now, right? Uh, so even better. Uh, I this uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, there were a lot of log for shell instances internal to environments that were not patched. Uh, and the initial, you know, uh, initial scramble was to make sure that we patched everything that was externally facing, um, you know, and, and got that vulnerability kind of, you know, mitigated to some extent. But I think a lot of people, you know, maybe deprioritized patching the internal servers. So we've got some new malware that looks for vulnerable log for uh, J um, instances inside and then uses that to install a new, you know, rootkit. I think it was... Uh, home kit, right, is, uh, is what gets installed there. Uh, if, uh, if Frog for Shell finds a vulnerable server internally once, it, once something lands. Got it. Now, I've got a frog one for you, David, and, I'll, and our audience can participate uh, in this one too. How deep can a frog swim? Hmm. Anybody want right. to get... I got it. Are you guys ready? Knee deep, knee deep, oh. deep knee deep. That was a good for you right there. You got me, man. That sounds now, right up my let's alley. Let's kind of think back to what we were doing on Thanksgiving Day 2023. Because for Cloudflare, wasn't necessarily uh, uh, the best day. Although maybe this is good news. We'll let you guys decide. That the, There was a threat actor that was detected on Cloudflare's Atlassian server, and it looks like they took a pretty near immediate response and assured their customer that no, their customers that no data was impacted. Round or about November 15th, threat actors gained initial access to Cloudflare's Okta, uh, targeting IT and application uh, employees for user compromise. After landing in Okta, they used that to pivot to Script Runner for Jira, which is a lot, would allow them to gain uh, you know lateral movement, gain additional access in the environment. Environment. Somewhere along the way, though, they got picked up by, by CrowdStrike and they put their code red security response training into action. Uh, what happened there is they rotated thousands of credentials, removed command and control channels and rebooted machines. And so this makes me think that this is really a good news story because data wasn't impacted, but also because it looks like that they've prepared for this moment. Well, it makes me want to ask our audience a question, you know, how many orgs that are you know, attending today have some type of code red or some type of, you know, major incident response plan in that they've at least practiced or written down on paper that if something like what happened to Cloudflare happened to you, you'd be able to rotate 5,000 credentials and remove command and control servers and reboot machines in as little as an evening. That's yeah, pretty impressive. I can see why this might be the half good news there. It's the half good news, right? Yeah. They, they had an event, but they were pretty being pretty transparent about it, and it seems like no customer data was impacted. 
Yeah, and, and if data isn't breached, right, it's, you know, it's hard, sort of hard to say there was lasting damage there. It's kind of like this is, you know, if you're going to anticipate somebody's going to get fished, an account is going to get compromised, you know, something's they're going to have a have a vulnerable server on, you know, that's internet facing. Um, you know, this is kind of what's next, you know, how do you detect it, make sure you stop it before data is accessed. Now, you know, guys might be wondering, why do we bring the head of Verona's Threat Labs, our threat research arm today, is to talk about a pretty vulnerable vulnerability in a technology called Avanti. Devere, do you want to tell us about like what's going on here and um, you know how, why this has surfaced up? Sure thing. So Avanti is quite a large vendor, uh, being able to um, basically having different suites of products from NDM mobile. Uh, device management and VPNs and whatnot. And Ivanti has been tar targeted for quite a while uh, in the sense of different vulnerabilities being found on various, on, on their own platforms. Now, with regards to threat actors that target specific platforms, we've seen it all the time. We've seen like Citrix VPN being targeted and continuously and Citrix releasing new patches and whatnot. And we need to remember that from these core components of organizations from MDM and VPNs, threat actors are able to pivot into the organization and, and perform lateral movement. And this is exactly what we saw over here. Uh, through a game of whack-a-mole, um, threat actors specifically uh, unknown and uncategorized uh, 5221 channeling threat actors started exploiting uh, event VPN in the wild, while not only uh, exploiting it for quite a while, but also bypassing the, the mitigations that were in, in employed by Ivanti itself, which is like, a, again, a game of whack-a-ball because it shows the persistency of that specific group uh, showing value in targeting that specific platform and continuously abusing and trying to get access to it. Now, basically, by trying to, uh, to, to chain several vulnerabilities together, they were able not only to, to control that specific appliance, but to pivot inside the, the, the organization, uh, auto, like using, of course, scripts, but also to impact it in a very short time. Okay. Um, and Devere, just a quick shout out to, I think it was a Google owned Mandiant that, that originally broke the news about exactly. that. Exactly. And you wanted to tell people a little bit more about how it works. Exactly. So. With regards to SSRF, uh, SSRF is server-side request forgery. It's like making a service uh, work for you, being con controlled remotely, but without being able to fully send uh, commands. It's not like you're running uh, uh, your terminal and you send your commands and that's it, you're, you're in full control. It's like semi-control in that sense. So with regards to... Um, the, the main vulnerabilities that were used, um, it seems that Ivanti used a specific vulnerable XML library to parse XML files. And in that sense, the threat actors were able to, to send a crafted payload, as you can see over here uh, highlighted, uh, in that sense of, um, hey, uh, uh, front end, please go to the back end and uh, send that command. So that's how SSRF works, uh, basically telling the front end, the, the, the part that you communicate with to go to the back end, to the, to the real server side and perform commands or actions on your behalf. Now, chain together and, and going into one level above, uh, the threat actors were able to, to craft a specific payload to not only um, perform actions from the front end to the back end, but also tell the back end to connect back to the threat actor. And this is exactly what we see over here, that payload is actually a Python script obfuscated in a very uh, unsophisticated payload within an XML file. And you can see on the terminal from the left, a CRL command saying, um, here's, the, here's the path I'm trying to access with to and posting that specific data. And from that moment on, not only the backend actually connects back to the, to the, to the attackers, it's running on root. And this is exactly that, what you can see on the right terminal. Now, from that moment on, the, the threat actors, the Chinese linked uh, threat group, was attempting to exploit mass amount of machines worldwide 
um, and of course exploit the most, I think the fastest way to exploit an Active Directory. Uh, back in 2021, there was a very unsophisticated payload that allowed uh, a thread actor to gain full domain admin uh, privileges by simply adding a new machine accounts to the organization and impersonating as a DC. And that caused uh, a KDC confusion. That's something that uh, was patched. And if any organization was indeed vulnerable to that, and of course the event vulnerabilities, they were compromised in like a sec in seconds. And currently there's a huge um, effort worldwide to to by threat actors worldwide to target and compromise Ivanti machines so much that not only uh, Ivanti is has been working tirelessly to release mitigations and patches and whatnot, but also CISA, uh, as as we're all aware, released a, a bulletin that is something that, personally speaking, as a professional, haven't seen for quite a while. I think even even ever like to immediately disconnect any Ivanti appliances from federal agencies being used. That's how um, I think critical CISA sees that in terms of Ivanti's. Yeah, and, and Devere, if I could just interrupt for a second, I, I just want to emphasize for our audience a point you just made. It, it's so rare that we see an emergency directive get issued by CISA and for an emergency directive get issued, and I think it was Friday morning, that by the end of the day, Friday, you must disconnect all Avanti products, just like mandated. It's 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 it kind of sounds like a solar winds level type of a response. Absolutely, absolutely. Not to bring up a, a, an old breach here, but like I mean, I I remember organizations thinking about having to unplug their network management appliances back in you know 2019 or 2020 and now we're seeing the CISA tell federal agencies not to do it and and where are we today i believe that the patches were released but they're found to not be sufficient in fixing it exactly so i can tell you from my personal stand point of view so uh we're working closely with the israeli uh, national cert and for my colleagues the amount of phone calls that they got for the past three weeks to patch and continuously patch, and not only to patch, uh, it seems that the patches were were useless. And there were bulletins also over here in Israel that uh, mitigations are currently uh, not working well. I believe that the latest mitigation was in, fa in fact valid, but I think based on everything that's going on, that's a very rare case of like immediately disconnect everything, do not use that until a uh, 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 a relevant, a relevant solution is found. I think that is just like insane, and, and I haven't seen that uh, in my career, to be honest. Yeah, same, same. Okay. And um, uh, we got one one question that came in from one of our audience members, which was uh, they believe Avanti advised to do a full reset on the devices before applying the patches as well, right? Yeah, that's correct, and that's due to the fact that um, CISA believed that threat actors were in fact. Uh, controlling that appliance. And the recommendation was to hunt for any IOCs, for any specific files or, or web shells being used by the threat actors by this Chinese link group, uh, specifically allowing them to maintain control of the appliance even after the patch itself. Now, um, it is what it is, like uh, a full reset and, uh, of course, apply patches and whatnot. Wow. Well, wow. well, um, you know, stay stay tuned. I'm sure we'll have more to say about Avanti and the the fallout from from this zero day in the weeks to come. Uh, we're going to take a minute and, and see if anything else has come in over the Q and A, uh, and then um, uh, we'll, we'll answer what we can and uh, we'll we'll launch a quick poll as well. So uh, another question came in from Charles: Wasn't the initial attack or the foot in the door via an insecure API? Yes, that's correct. Uh, in a couple of, of the vulnerabilities themselves, uh, there was uh, uh, a bypass to the to the authentication mechanism, allowing to access the API directly. Um, I think we saw it with other vendors as well in the past that certain APIs were not protected as well, and allowing threat actors to remotely control them or send commands. Thanks for being here. State of Cybercrime is made possible by uh, you, our audience, as well as you, David, Devere, and all of our uh, production uh, team. So thanks, production team and co-hosts. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today and tuning in to another episode of State of Cybercrime. Thank you so much.
Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you a very good much. afternoon.